Welcome back. So in the last video, we went through the basics of how to take a simple model uh, that we've written down a likelihood for and convert that into something we can do numerical optimization on. As a quick review, we, we did that by writing a function that represents the likelihood, verify that we could pass in the parameters as a vector and get a likelihood back, pass that through numerical optimization routine and learned how to interpret uh, the, the outputs from that in terms of getting back parameter estimates and stuff like that. Uh, that simple example was one that we knew an analytical solution to. It was one where we derived that ourselves and it was also pretty intuitive. I wanna now move on to how you would actually apply this in practice, which is usually to problems uh, where uh, writing down the likelihood would be more challenging and you want to um, be able to use these numerical methods to solve things. And a very common case of that is when we're going to have nonlinear models or, or more mechanistic models. So here's the example we had earlier. How do we fit something like this Michaelis Menten function that is a, a nonlinear function? And it is nonlinear both in the fact that it draws a curve that asymptotes and in the fact that even from a statistician's perspective, it's not a linear model because what this beta two is in the denominator. Um, there's no way to reorganize this model in a way that we can write this out as an additive combination of parameters. So it is truly nonlinear, both in terms of parameters and, and variables. So how do we do this? So as before, first step is to write down our likelihood and take the logs. And again, we're gonna do that using code. <clears throat> so here's an example of writing down this michaelis menten likelihood as a negative log likelihood. So as remember, we give it a name. We're going to pass in our vector of all of our parameters. We're going to pass in all of our data. Here we need both an x and a y. Name of the function, parameter vector, again, we're assuming a normal distribution for our error. So we're gonna use the D norm to represent uh, that normal density. So that's our, our, uh, our likelihood. We're gonna pass in the data that we're trying to predict, our Y data, our response data. In this case, it's, it's the growth data. We're gonna pass in uh, the mean. And so the important thing to remember about these likelihoods is that most of the time what we're doing is we're writing down models that actually predict means. And so the, in this case, we've put the equation for the model here. You could have done that calculation first and then passed it in second. So I could have written this as a line before this sum. Uh, I could have, it could be some more complicated thing that requires, you know, running simulation, stuff like that. Whatever it is, you know, for each X, we predict what comes out of this model some predicted y, and that that predicted y for each x is what goes in for the mean. So each data point is predicting its own mean. Uh, here, the beta one and the beta two were what they were in the likelihood uh, in the equation themselves, and beta three is our standard deviation. Uh, ag again, we want to return a log likelihood, so we'll use log equals true on our density. We'll sum up all those uh, log likelihoods, and we're going to put a negative sign in here to, so that we can minimize this. Another way of looking at this, here's having written down, here's writing down that log likelihood as an equation. So we have a negative sum of the logs of our normal density of our data given our model and the standard deviation. And we can just map this. Here's our negative sum. Here's our log, here's our normal, our y, our mean, and our standard deviation. So realistically, I probably, if I was doing this, I would have written down the likelihood um, and taken the logs probably by hand in some sense, at least at the high level. I don't need to take, I don't need to take a log of what's inside the normal because I have just the denorm, but I've you know, converted the product of normals into a sum of logged normals 
and I've written down the model, translate one to the other. So write down the likelihood, take the logs. Next, we need to find the value of the parameters that minimizes this negative log likelihood. And we're going to do that again using Optum. So this is a slightly more complicated uh, version of a call to Optum. Um, as before, the first thing we pass into Optum is our initial guess. And here I'm putting in an initial guess uh, that actually looked at the data. So uh, I needed a, an initial guess on what it's asymptoting to. So here, just as a guess, I said, find me the biggest value of Y and maybe give me 90% of that. I didn't want to set it to 100% because maybe I think there's noise, but maybe I set it to 100%. Doesn't really matter. This is just subjective and it's just, again, to get us to a level of accuracy where the, the curve would even show up on the plot. Um, here, I want an initial guess on this, the second parameter was that half saturation constant. You know, at what value of x am I halfway between the minimum and maximum? My x went from 0 to 1, so I just put in 0.5. Uh, and then I needed to guess on my standard deviation. And here, I took the standard deviation of the y and divided it by 2. Uh, just because I'm essentially guessing that my R squared will be about 0.5. So I'm guessing that the model explained about half the variability in the data. That may be wrong, but it, again, just gets me in the ballpark. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to get things to show up on the graph. Oops. One. Back one. Second, we're passing our likelihood function in. That's simple. Uh, it's, again, it's not quoted. You're literally passing the function as uh, an argument to another function. Uh, next, I'm going to use some optional arguments within Optum. I didn't have to do these, but they're just to show you that Optum has additional arguments. So Optum actually implements a, a number of different arguments, a number of different optimization algorithms under the hood. And if you look at the help for Optum, you'll see um, what the options are for what methods they are for those algorithms and some descriptions of them. So I've you know, chosen uh, an algorithm that has some weird acronym. It doesn't really matter what it is, but in fact, the reason I've chose that algorithm is it allows me to pass these other optional arguments, which are a lower and upper bound. And that's just setting boundaries on where we can look for parameters. So None of these parameters could be negative, so I set the lower bound for zero, and I set upper bounds that are realistic. So you know, the asymptote can't be more than twice the largest value. The, the if the zero the data goes from zero to one, the, the half saturation can't be bigger than one. And uh, my R squared, you know, I set the standard deviation can't be bigger than one point one times the, the standard deviation of the y. Basically, you know, it would correspond to a negative R squared. So. And then the other thing here is to note that I uh, passed in both the x data and the y data by name and that last name. What we get out, we get out again. Par is our best fit of the parameters. Uh, value is the like the negative log likelihood at those values. Uh, that's a handy thing to have if you're calculating something like an AIC. Uh, how many guesses it took, 48, convergence status zero, which is success. And here it gave me a message telling me uh, that it converged based on relative reduction of the function. So it's that delta y being smaller than some threshold value is what caused it to decide to stop. Here we can actually now go back and see what I, I drew, drew, drew the best fit line in red. And I actually also am reporting here, uh, this isn't real data. I, I actually had R simulate this data. So I actually, in this case, knew the true value of those parameters. And then I could see what R generated. And uh, the true value, the, the, the fit values are very close to the the simulated values. And in fact, part of the reason that they're not exact, again, is because it's a finite number of data points that were simulated, 100. And so there's going to be differences between the, the true and fit values just because of that kind of 
uh, the fact that we're adding a lot of random numbers. Um, what I've done here though, is actually a, a very useful thing to do when you're writing these, these likelihood models, which is if you have a complicated model and you wanna make sure it's fitting it correctly, you can always simulate data from that model, fit it and verify that you're getting the right parameters back. So if, if you're getting back parameters that are really different uh, from what you use, the ones you use to generate the data, uh, simulate the data, uh, then there's probably something wrong in your in your likelihood and you wouldn't want to go apply that to real data. After you've done this sort of check and be like, look, I simulated data, uh, it worked well, I can then apply that to real data with co greater confidence that it's not getting stuck in local minima, that it's able to work and give me a sensible answer. And just visually, the, the difference between these two is, is pretty minor. Uh, to kind of wrap up, uh, we can use this approach to fit any function, you know, any model that's kind of in a black box. Uh, we don't need to know how the, what's, how the guts of the model is working to be able to fit it by maximum likelihood numerically. Uh, like with GLMs, we can relax the assumption of normality. So if I wanted to fit this with a, a Poisson error instead of a, a normal error, I would just use d pois instead of d norm. If I want to use a binomial error, if I wanted to use a gamma error or log normal or whatever error I want to use, I just use the error model that I think makes sense for the data that I'm fitting. Uh, this is something I would cover in 509, but you, you know, most of what we focused on here is modeling the the mean, but you can also write models to explain the variance. So you don't have to be locked into this assumption of constant variance. You can actually model the variance explicitly. Uh, and what we're going to go from here is to now think about how to estimate uncertainties with this. And the maximum likelihood gives you a single best estimate of this model. Uh, but what we'll cover in the next few weeks are how do we get the uncertainties in the parameters so that we can do things like test if they're different than zero, um, how can we use that, those uncertainties in the parameters to draw our confidence intervals around our model and our predictive intervals uh, to do hypotheses, tests, and make predictions. And I'll say, even if you go on to more advanced stats, so like Bayesian methods and stuff like that, the likelihood is still going to be the backbone for pretty much all advanced statistics, regardless of your, whether you uh, take a, 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 a frequentist or Bayesian perspective, on statistics, it's it's really the 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 core idea to higher level statistics. And once we kind of get past models that we can fit analytically, these numerical methods are going to be really common. Uh, so that wraps it up. And uh, thanks. I'll talk to you all next week. <laughs>